a couple years later, we did another one, and now Sang the French is up to something like six, you know. And now there are ten minute play festivals and productions all over the world. You know, there's, I mean, there's an organization out of Australia that's called Short Plus Sweet, and they, they, they produce festivals in countries in that part of the world, you know, that all over. I, did. I had a, a playwright who I've been helping with a little bit, and she sent a play out there, and it was done, but Short and Sweet picked it, and it was done at their Malaysia festival, and won an award for the best of the festival, you know. So, you know, you, your work can get done all over the world. So, uh, so we, so so this just exploded. So um, uh, Smith and Krauss, uh, well, I'll get that. With Samuel Francis, I was able to get a lot of lot of plays published by playwrights that sub subsequently became very famous, you know. And I had two varying degrees was instrumental in getting Samuel French to publish it, including Jane Martin, but yeah, Tina Howe, Don Nigro, and lots of these. And uh, and then uh, it, you know, I, I started editing my books for Smith and Rose, and I did their bi annual monologue books. And they, did a, they did an anthology of new plays by women, which they don't do anymore, which pisses me off. Well, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and there's uh, also, you produce the uh, Boston <coughs> Theater Marathon. Yeah, I don't, I'm not involved in that, though. Yeah. That's the, you see, Smith and Krause is basically all freelancers. Okay. You know, it's, there's, it's not, it's, you know, the, uh, a man and a woman, they, Marisa Smith and Eric Krauss run it out of their home in New Hampshire, and they hire various people to do various projects. And um, uh, about three or four years, they published like, all of the Boston Marathon, theater marathon plays. And uh, so, so uh, then uh, they, they, they were publishing an anthology of 10-minute plays annually that Michael Dixon was editing. And then I don't know why, but they asked me to do it. I don't know. So I said, okay. So I started doing Originally, it was they would be two books. One was plays for two two actors, and one was plays for three or more actors. And I did. I and then about two or three years ago, they said, "Don't put them all together in one book." And I said, "That's a big long book." And they said, "That's okay." You know. So so uh, so now that I've bought the last three years, but what I've done for the last two years, I want you to know is that I've been collecting uh, a list of all the people in the world that do 10 minute plays. <laughs> and with contact information and everything, you know, the hoo-ha festival, the yada yada, you know. And so for the last two years, every, every the book that I have in the back, there's a list of all of them. So that, you know, you can get that book and you can, you can put it, make your own database for submissions and you know, probably some of them are, don't do it anymore. But you know, I, I try to update it as much as I can. So every year, so the most up to date one is the new book, which just came out, 2014. Yes. And is it available in that room? I don't. I hope so. They have some. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have. They sent some down. Down. But you know, I don't know. Maybe everyone's bought it. <laughs> but you can you can get it online or call them up and uh, and they didn't send my new playwrights book, which pissed me. <laughs> one. You know, I don't know why. But you know what they also have in there that I highly recommend is their most recent publication. I call them they because I really don't work. I'm a freelancer. You know, I work for them and applause. Is the most recent hot off the press title is by Michael Bigelow Dixon, Yay. who you'll meet. And, He's right and, here. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and it's, he'll, he'll probably tell you about it, but it's, it's in my opinion. It, I mean, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. I disagree with a lot of it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but it's, it is, in my opinion, could become as influential a book uh, as, like, the theater in its double or the empty space. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the manifesto of what I call the burgeoning anything but realism movement. Yeah. <laughs> and it talks about why, you know, and it's, it's very, very persuasive, and I highly recommend that book. Great. Yeah, so that's me. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Next, I want to go to, to Linda Tadjian from uh, 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 Dramatic Publishing. Uh, and what's interesting about, about 
about everyone here and these publishers is that there's some things that are shared and there's some sort of things that are different. And so I want to talk about that. And one of the things that I'm very impressed with uh, what's happening with you is that the kind of thematic collections that you're doing, the editorial decisions, and in some ways it's kind of a producerial thing that's happening with several of these publishers, which is really interesting in terms of that kind of imagination to put things together. So, uh, yeah. Well, most of our team in place collections have been commissioned. Um, the most recent one is The Bully Place, which I commissioned, and we asked 22 of our current authors to write Tim and Place about around the theme of bullying, and didn't expect all 22 to um, agree, but they all did, so it's also a big public collection. And uh, we have, we have um, authors like Stephen Gregg, Stephen Gregory, um, Richard Dresser, Jose Cruz Gonzalez, really, really wanted to play, and it really took off. It's, um, it's sells tons of copies of this in their all sorts of collections, and because they're 22, they can be done in different ways, and it's a multitude of Goes ten by ten. Ten short plays, teams about ethics and values. Also commissioned from um, by one twenty-five and ten, thirty-five and ten, and as well. Um, but others have come in through the years and just submitted. I should have there are uh, University and Love, Death, and the Crown by John Jory. Those have been. Um, we published those probably 20 years ago. And after the beat, seven short plays by Seth Kramer, Kramer. There's one on here, the Tarantino variation, that gets done all the time by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also included in other, in other anthologies as well. And the cell phone rings to the beat, which is around the idea of cell phones. Um, in case you didn't know. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, but they're mostly been commissioned, but we do look. Um, Usually when we get submissions and we accept unsolicited submissions, there we, we seldom get that many 10-minute play submissions. We get collections of 10-minute play submissions by the same author. So when we pull together something thematically, we usually commission those plays mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And right here to my right, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Dramatist Play Service, Shorter. Uh, Craig Possible. Um And his table is quite impressive because if those of you who like 10 minute plays, you'll see what good company you're in. Uh, yeah. From Wendy Wasserstein and Chris Durang and Terrence McNally and what John Patrick Shanley writes when he's made to go home. <laughs> <laughs>
um, and um, I, uh, you know, also we started getting into most of our collections. Obviously, as I've kind of shown, are by single authors because you you tend to get a single collection unless you commission something like that, or if you put out a critical call. Um, but I, you know, knew that a lot of our authors were maybe writing a one-off, you know, like they did the 24-hour plays or some other contest. So I started um, uh, editing for us um, a collection just called Outstanding Short Plays, where I would get about 10 of them together. And this was the first volume, which came out a couple of years ago. I've edited the second volume, which will be out later this year. Um, so it's just a way, you know, to, to work with our authors when they don't have six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them. Um, you know, but, you know, the, big, the biggest and latest, I think, of the ten minute things is Almost Maine, which some people may not think of as, as a, a ten minute place, but actually, you know, it's a series of, of them, you know, on a, on a theme and strung together in a lovely way. And this has been, I think, one of the most produced plays <laughs> yeah. in, in North America. The last three years alone, We've had over 500 productions a year. Of they just did a revival in New York. Yeah, and they just did a revival in New York, which John Carriani uh, was acting in. Um, and I mean, this is a real Cinderella story because it was done in New York. You know, it ran for a month or so. It closed. It didn't make much uh, news or headway. And slowly, people started discovering it. Word of mouth got out there, and slowly, we were licensing it constantly. And I put it in my new playwrights book, yeah. scenes from it, and, and I think that's one of the ways they heard about it. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And suddenly, every school, college, community theater, you know, who knows, <laughs> people by the side of the road started. <laughs> <laughs>
sort of splitting them off into different genres, like this one's the comedies and dramas, and so we have a fair amount of collections for short plays, and they do really, really well. I mean, some of them, some of our authors that have full-length plays, their 10-minute play actually does better for them. We just have real reach in that market, and um, community theaters love to do them for benefits because they can involve so many different people, and you can have, you know, like, the middle-aged couple who's the star in all the community theater plays can be in this one, and then the young people who are just kind of getting involved in the group can be in this one, and it really allows communities to, you know, make things flexible for themselves and involve a lot of people, or it also allows professional companies to use two actors or three actors over and over. So it works for lots of groups, which is, I, I think, why um, it's such a popular form. Um, so we, we have that. We have plays that come in through the transom, as we say. Um, but we also then, like, for example, we have um, a, a group of Adam Simkowitz, who's a great writer based in, uh, well, Connecticut now, um, sent us a group of plays that are all around the theme of love. And so we're publishing those. So it's, it comes either way, but I would say for us, mostly, it's us cherry-picking ones that we're excited about and putting into collections. We also um, pretend this is a book with like, a really fancy cover that says Naked Angels on it. Um, so we have <laughs> put it with a collection of um, 10 Minute Plays by Naked Angels, which hopefully will be here later today. Um, we also have a collection called 24 by 24, so it's 24 short plays by 24 writers that are all 10 minutes, and they're great writers. Um, so those hopefully will be here later today as well. So that's, it's something we're really excited about, it's something that we've seen a lot of success in, and something that um, we feel like is really appropriate for cross markets, and I think that's why it does so well. Thank you so much. Um, 
you know, we, we choose the sixth play with the help of a lot of industry colleagues and professional playwrights. So it's not just Samuel French making these decisions, it's actually like kind of a collective hive mind from the industry. And uh, what often succeeds is the non-realistic stuff, which I think it was very interesting to hear John um, champion for those plays that maybe take more risks or the short plays that are kind of adventurous or have unanswered questions at the end or um, so it, it's very exciting. I like the short play festival is my favorite time of year because we get to see some really crazy stuff on stage and kind of get out of that commercial like oh will this sell or how, you know who's interested and really see playwrights kind of in their rawest like let's just throw it up there and see if it works form. Um, and we've gotten some, I think, the most exciting writing um, coming through that festival, so it's very exciting. And we've also forged some really great relationships. I don't think Steve was in the room, which is fine, because I skipped We have this. several of Steve, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, we, yeah, this is it. And Steve is um, also similar to almost Maine. Um, I would encourage you to check out his short play collections, because he does this interesting thing with his shorts, where he kind of weaves them together to tell a, a larger story or a larger even like aesthetic story. Um, so he has a very like certain style in a lot of the plays and when they're together on stage it kind of creates this ambiance to the evening. Um, we also have talked, um, you know, I think the political idea is very exciting too or like having a daily news kind of approach to plays because it seems like there's a large trend right now with um, like theater breaking through barriers is doing for people with disabilities, and we're seeing um, you know, short plays about wars and short plays about. So, as a writer, like getting things together, like we do publish a lot of collections by one writer, but even going further than that, it seems like we publish a lot of collections by one writer with a theme. <laughs> so, like Tina Howe, for example, I brought last year, I brought her um, plays for women. She wrote this, like, it's called Towering Tiger Lilies, and, and that's a great collection where it's, it's very. So it's like a water aerobics play where people are lactating in the pool and nursing <laughs> mothers. I mean, it's so adventurous and exciting. So I would, yeah, I mean, so as a writer, yeah, I think, um, you know, yeah, finding a way to kind of curate your own material so that it really makes sense for a theater um, to put it up is kind of an exciting notion. And, and uh, you know, there's lots of fun things you can do with that. So. Yes, we have standing on ceremony. And is that something you commissioned, or is it such a? No, they were they were being done. I think okay. a lot of them. I was in uh, reaction to the Proposition Eight in right. California, um, and uh, there were actually a lot more. I think to begin with, um, but we contacted them and they sent us what they thought. Oh, it was done off Broadway at yeah. the final right. yeah. yeah. Well, it started in, in L.A. And, then it, and, then it <laughs> and also Motherhood Out Loud, which is the same, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Mother Heard Out Loud is more along the lines of the uh, love loss and what I wore, or you know, yeah. or even a kinder, gender version of the giant. <laughs> but again, it's like it's a bunch of different writers coming together to do yeah. things yeah. around the theme. Yeah. Producer, yeah. Mother Heard Yeah. And yeah. then did them at uh, Franklin Street. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question because it also leads into the whole idea of like what you look for, how you get something published. You know, what's the best way? An open you know, what submission policy is for each yeah. of you. Is it a good idea for a writer? Like, you this thematic thing is very fascinating to me because the kind of editorial and almost professorial, uh, you know, imagination that enters into that. Is it something that if someone has a couple of plays on the team, maybe they find even, you know, take the initiative to find writers they know and submit, you know, and suggest? So I'm curious in terms of, like, what do you look for, you know, if people have 10 minutes plays, what's good advice? Um, well, I can, yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> the practical side of me, that's like other than the curatorial, like, yeah. just make sure, you know, whatever thematic evenings you're putting together, I, I think what Larry said about negotiating for 25 different contracts can be very overwhelming and very difficult in some cases, especially if um, writers aren't willing to take a favored nations agreement. Yeah. So if you're, and, and I'm sure favored nations agreements will get covered in yes, we'll Susan's about <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more detail later. But, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, making sure all the legalese is in place. If you're getting together a group of friends and you're like, hey, let's write plays about Obama, um, um, you know, make sure that that the you're really looking long term, so that there's a vision of publication down the road, and you've kind of counted for that in your early discussions about where this is going. I think that's really important. 
Um, I mean, I've been approached recently about several collections, and it's difficult because they, there hasn't been that forethought, and then, you know, there's multiple agents involved, and there's, um, you know, writers have different expectations, and, and loyalties of publishers, so it gets, it gets a little complicated. Um, yeah, so I'd say there, there's that, but also I think, uh, you know, French is not unsolicited anymore. We think we have a query process, and so we review 10 page samples and kind of project ideas before asking oh, to see. God. That's <laughs> 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 right, yeah. So we ask to see, you know, and we also ask for like a history of production. Um, I think we have a very, um, at least I kind of have a philosophy that things need to be stage tested, that playwriting is as much a performance craft as it is a literary craft on the page. Um, Does level of production uh, factor in? And that's it depends on market. Yeah. So I, I will say if you're writing plays and you know they're for high schools, um, and if you have a track record of, you know, okay, we've done this out of high school, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to have five off off Broadway or off Broadway production or whatever. But it needs to be, you know, you've tested it within its own audience, and there's some. Um, evidence that it works with that audience, so that, you know, the people are contacting you about it, it got great reviews, it was extended, it sold crazy amounts of tickets, and everybody, you know, um, you're like, oh my god, I'm getting so many licensing requests, I can't even deal with it. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. What we call them <laughs> like <laughs> 2,000 people liked it on Facebook. Yeah, actually, social media well, recently, yeah. we've been, um, I have to say, especially for some of the larger shows, it's like knowing that, um, I will say, I always say this to playwrights, but I do Google everyone that submits um, because I want to see, like, oh, you know, reviews. And, so, it's, yeah, it's helpful that like, having a web page, okay, well, I can go back and see, like, if they won awards, like, do they have relationships with theaters in place? Like, if we pick this up and, you know, we need to, we have a marketing team, we have a great marketing team at French, so, you know, and a really proactive licensing team, so we want to call the theaters you have relationships with and say, like, hey, did you know they have a short play collection? You know, do you have a place for that in your season? So, so really, um, yeah, it, it does, as much as it is a play, is a play a good play, is it a successful play within its own parameters, you know, are you, have you thought about your career as a playwright, and are you a successful playwright? Which is a weird thing to say. Yeah, in the agency know. world, we say, is there a motor to it? What do you have to do Well, no, I mean, we've got a similar yeah. uh, submission policy. I mean, the question that I get asked all the time is, you know, can you take uh, new plays, un unproduced plays? Um, and I say, well, you know, if you go through the submission process, you know, we'll certainly take a look at them. But I, I try to dissuade them from just, you know, finish it, hit print, or hit send, and, and get it to us. Um, because we're, we're the final stop yep. for your play. We're the, we're the last thing. If you just send it to us, straight away and, and we love it and publish it, it's probably going to vanish. Um, because there are so many in plays. Markets, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. But even even so it's very hard yeah. because uh, you know there's so many there's so many plays fighting for so many slots and everybody is really looking for, you know, well what was big in New York? What was big in Chicago? What are they doing, you know, in Seattle or Los Angeles? So that they tend to go to, you know, schools will go to a lot of the old favorites. Um, schools will go to what is, you know, brand new that they think they should do. So if, you know, your play can kind of get missed in, in, in all of that shuffle. And so it's incumbent on, on the writer and to kind of push that boulder of their play as far along and up the hill as they can on their own to get it to the point where it gets some kind of visibility. Uh, it doesn't have to be a New York production or anything like that, but to, to get it on, to give it a production history so that it's not just like you have to read it to, to find out how, how great it is, it helps if you've had some kind of like presence that visibility. Well, I'm going to piggyback to you after that, um, and I, want, I don't want to dominate for a long time.
So I think also to publish with them. For licensing agents, it's a nightmare. We've had authors that are very successful large plays that all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you know, I want an intermission or I'm going to change the ending. I never like the scene. But then there's all of a sudden there's two different versions of the play that are out on the market. And if you don't want that early version performed, it's very hard to oh, yeah. please. And, 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 you know? and sometimes it's it's, if, if the writer is suddenly like, yes, now this is the definitive version, go out there and find the 40,000 copies of my old play them. and take them back. Or they get really surprised when that old version is yeah. produced somewhere. Like, how could this happen? Like, it's been 20 years. <laughs> well, I'm trying to explain to a theater, you know, why they'll be like, but you printed this, and you're like, yeah, but it's not, you know, you have to do it the way the writer wants. Well, they'll be like, I like the film version. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and there were a couple of writers, it's like every, like every day they got out and wrote their play. And one of them was David Ray, who kept doing oh. it all the way over. There must have been eight different versions of In the Boom Boom Room. Uh -huh. and, 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 and the all-time worst of my life was Robert Patrick. Yeah, he wanted us to, you know, uh, not to sell our edition with a 2,000 copies. Anybody that wanted to play, the play would, uh, he wanted them to, us to send them his new version. And we're going, Robert, what are we going to do with these 2,000 copies? And so he finally got so annoyed that he just sold all his copyrights to Samuel French. Yeah. So now Samuel French owns the copyright to Kennedy Jones. Yeah. But yeah, if there's any inkling that the script is not done, I mean, I think. but also the school tours. We do a middle school tour over the course of the year, and I think this year it was like 40,000 kids saw short plays. And this collection included, or maybe last year's collection, included two pieces from the Bully Plays. And one thing I would tell all of you out there is if you, um, one of the things to think about is, especially for schools, 
if you're getting funding from grants or from school communities, they want thematic, they want, they want, Ricky, you know that, a connection to, to a theme. So yeah. bullying is huge. So we went to Linda's collection and suddenly went, oh, this is really wonderful. So we found place within that collection. But the other thing that happened in, uh, is that one of the young ladies you might have seen last night on the on stage, the, the willowy one, um, <laughs> Mary Sansone became so captivated as a young actor working the school tour, she's now one of our playwrights who is writing for the tour. And I'm going to be sending you her plays because they're terrific. And she she's two minutes out of that age group and we can relate and looks like she does, she's 26, who would know? But um, I, would, I will tell you that those, that's a, that was a brilliant idea and I'm, I'm hoping it's really successful out it there. It is very successful, so much so that I'm working on a new one. And you know how I always said before that we usually commission plays that are thematic and that we haven't really looked at him in plays? That's changed. We accept unsolicited manuscripts. We get about 500 a year. Um, usually they're one acts or full lengths, but we started to like take a much closer look at 10 minute plays and um, like you do, it, we take the ones we, we like and we keep them until we have something that follows some kind of theme um, and, and then we plan to go ahead and publish collections based upon that theme. And one of the um, collections I'm collecting for right now are, are more More bully plays, or be something similar though. Bully will definitely be in the title. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It's it's still <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like any unfortunate resonant topic is probably something to think about dealing with. You know. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, there was one that came from over here. Can I add one? Type yes, thing? please. I want to say on the on the nature of thieves and that kind of thing. If you have a publisher, if you already are like published with one of us, or you know. Ask us, like say I'm thinking of writing some 10-minute yeah. plays, what is there a market for? I would have okay. said bully plays. So, you know, we're we're looking for stuff. If you know you're thinking of writing something, feel free to ask us because we're very aware of what people are asking for and what teachers are asking for. Yeah. Um, so one question from here is in terms of like you license all the plays. Do you do any trade publications that are just anthologies or do you license everything? That's the question for all of us. Um, is like, French has, we're old. <laughs> um, so we've done everything historically. Like there was a time where we were doing trade, um, and I'm actually working on for the OOB 40th anniversary next year. To hope all of you fly to New York is going to be the best party for short play. <laughs> we're already planning it. We've been planning it for like two years. Um, so I, I am putting together a, a trade more a trade book of winners from that festival. So Teresa Reback actually got her. Wet in the short play festival, Shirley Laro. And I got a story about those two options. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, 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 but, but that will be more like a trade, and we'll probably bend it through the trade channels. Um, the differences between acting edition and trade editions, which maybe we'll get in on a later panel, but if you guys do the one on ones, um, we can probably explain further. But our acting editions are designed to go with licenses, so if someone is calling us for, to get a license of the show. This is an acting edition, just that like this regular thing that doesn't have a holding. And this is too, yeah. but yeah. it's, yeah. 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 It doesn't it's just have photographs on the cover and fancy things. Yeah. It's just very Well, packed. sometimes it's not well, like sometimes it's true. True. That's <laughs> Whereas Smith and Carl's only publishes trade editions. They're, they're more expensive. They're snazzier covers. And but you want them on people's bookshelves. Yeah, and they're taught in, they have different distribution channels. Colleges, course adoption bookstores, yeah. Um, so it helps to know that difference, and, and most um, agreements with publishers are not exclusive in terms of trade and acting. So uh, like, for example, Larry can publish something in Best Short Plays, and then the, the author can send it to us for OOB, and you know, it, it can be in multiple collections. Yeah, because Smith & Cross doesn't do any licensing, and they don't ask for exclusives. So they could then have it published by Dramatic Public or anybody and have them license it. And, that, and we love that. Like, Year of the Rooster is getting printed in one of your books, and we're licensing it. Yeah. So if yeah. someone encounters it this way, they're just going to come to us. So it's a happy, friendly yeah. nice Almost thing. Almost. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, this is a nice symbiotic relationship between great and, and that's and what, Yeah, TCG as well. Who, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, TCG, most of our uh, larger plays are published in trade editions that are gorgeous, and we have a great work. And both are good because it gets it out there, you know. The yeah, copies it gets available it in marketplace. It's more revenue for the writer ultimately, yeah. depending on what agreement they have with the trade publisher. But.
query topic. So things yeah. that I just thought we might take advantage, like after bullying, are there any, a couple other things that people are looking for? Oh, what's right now? Or, yeah, what, do you have a sense of like what, what people are hungry for? We have one that's kind of fun, um, that, uh, it's a stage combat collection, um, and it's by the writer, uh, I'm having a brain fart. It's early. It's <laughs> Jeff Cole, I think, but he did, uh, like, Seven Santas, and so we also have a bunch of themes that are like naughty Christmas books. Uh, <laughs> eight right here monologues, which could stand all over. And um, uh, actually, Matt Holberman, who was here last year, had his Christmas shorts, um, which we've seen kind of a spike in that. And then he just won an Andy, which is crazy. <laughs> On the side. But yeah, so um, I, uh, holiday collections are always kind of fun. Um, there's a lot of them, so just be aware of that. I would also like, um, I didn't say this earlier, but Google the publisher, do your research before you submit. Uh, yeah. If you send us a collection of shorts to me that are holiday themed, I'll probably come back to you and say, well, we have like four other ones. I don't know if this is the right place. And that's as much about it being an advantageous relationship for both of us. I don't want to take your play if I don't think it's going uh, to get buried. It's going to compete like because stuff. that's really an injustice to you. And I don't want you to be like, well, why did my play do well? OK, well, you're And the playwright who wrote the other one, so why don't you take them? Yeah. I, I, I just, I'm all for awesome themes. <laughs> Good writing. Um, so, uh, I think I'm always, I would always, I'm always wondering why no one ever does like a 10 minute little short, tiny, funny riffs on classics. Like I feel like a collection of that. A oh, teacher would Christ go crazy. Yeah. 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 yeah, like teacher would go crazy over that. Think about what a teacher, we're really yeah. for 10 minute plays, yeah. thinking about yeah. universities, high schools, and community theaters. Um, we're thinking about professional theaters too. Sometimes they'll do that for a benefit. But think about what, what are teachers teaching? So bully plays make sense because that's, it gets better. That's a really big movement right now. That's zero tolerance bullying policies. Like they're really, that's really potent for schools right now. It's really important to them. Um, so yeah, like classics, because then they can, the other thing is, <laughs> this is A great sick. sample is Tom Stoppard's 15 years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's that's yeah. really, yep. the, you know, like, Schools now, because of all these crazy curriculum standards, no longer believe that a play is just literacy because it's a play. You have to like sell it, and it has to fit all these strands. So teachers are looking for things that they can claim as like English class. So you know what's ridiculous is, of course, we all here in this room know that any play is English class. But um, you know, so things like that are riffs on classic that are fun for the kids, but also educational in the traditional sense for an English class are really great. But make sure they're really classics, like that if there's an underlying rights issue. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> public domain. Yes. Public domain. Yeah, public Which domain. Which we'll talk about, we'll public talk about. Yeah, make sure, yeah. Every, every market's Shakespeare. going to have its own, <laughs> its own special themes, obviously, you know, high schools, like bullying. Um, you know, I would think that colleges, there's been so many cases of like, sexual abuse going on, what we've been hearing out in the news on the, on about, on the college campuses these days. I would think that that might be an interesting theme. You know, community theaters are probably going to want lighter, lighter fare for the most part. You know, the high school ones, no, no foul language. You know, blah, blah, blah. Lots of roles for women. That's Lots of roles really for women. Has to be more Colleges are always Colleges. looking for Everywhere. plays that have like girls. Those plays that you, you know, like. High schools, they always ask. Fifteen you know, characters. Can we women. cast the, the uh, police officer in, in yeah. arsenic and old lace with a woman, you know, girl? Yeah. So yeah. Senior theater would be another senior. Yeah. 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 yeah, we have a bunch of things. Yeah. Also, yeah. Alzheimer's is a big issue. Yeah, yeah. we just have yeah. As an activist, I wonder about climate change because, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like I never see <laughs> a lot about that. I would love to see more about that. It's not light and funny necessarily. <laughs>
is a record. It's really hard to kind of like. Yeah, it's ten minutes. Where were we? But even there, with the ten minute plays, I think I think that even there, if they have strong female roles, it makes it more. I would say if you have a large cast show too, um, reading other plays, like I know Israel Horowitz, who is a great short play writer, I, we have a great collection that I didn't bring by Israel, but um, he, you can order it. Please go get me free shipping. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has a play where people are all jogging in a marathon, and it's like eight people, and it's ten minutes, but it's fantastic. So I mean, read a lot of plays. Like find like I know we're all pushing our books, and it's kind of, but there's a reason for that. And the more you read, like you can see examples of where like oh, this doesn't really work in this large cast, and like this is how, you know, like like look at the form. Different question. Yes, and this one over there. John's first, and then John. Yeah. 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 Actually, she's at her end. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I work at um, Books and Books, and I'm actually part of the children's department. I'm in charge of book buying. So I was just actually just intrigued on whether or not you pay attention to the literary trends, i.e. we had the vampire dystopian kind oh, of, yeah. like if the trends correspond to or correlate to what submissions you get in or what submissions you pay attention to. Now it's like what I call cichlid, which like the main character has cancer or they have, or they just figure, <laughs> or there's something, yeah, false well, so stars you pay attention to what you're reading. So they wonder the challenge is <laughs> so I don't know if, if that's corresponding, because I know you were talking about bullying, and I know what I had to do ordering this coming for this coming fall, I had like six or seven books all about bullying, either in the perspective of the bully or in the perspective of the person being bullied. So I just was wondering if everything kind of ties in with like literary media and with like... I, I, I say yes, that's my short answer. I think it's hard. I mean, playwrights... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, because I, I mean, I think when everyone, when you sit down to write a play, you're not necessarily thinking about, okay, what trend am I trying to, I mean, <coughs> there are publishers here that aren't represented that are more tied into those, well, I mean, you, you guys publish a lot of children's literature and dramatic, or children's literature, but like, you have the giver, or you have the, um, and I think actually TYA, yeah, the Minneapolis Children's Theater and Seattle Children's Theater actually, um, when they commission work, they retain the licensing rights. Yeah. And they have a whole slew of stuff that's specifically for young audiences. It's called PYA, a place for young audiences. Yeah, yeah. And they may actually be more um, on those trends. I think because. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I couldn't. There's a couple of theaters that are doing I will that. say that um, we, we often look for work for, we do a lot of one act competition plays for high schools. And yes, we're very much clicked into what high school kids are watching outside of their theater classes, like Divergent and The Fault in Our Stars. And, you know, obviously we're, we're not able, because of rights issues, to get those exact things, but we're often looking for things that we know kids will gravitate to because it's what's in the ether right now. So I would say for the school market, that's very true, and those things speak to each other. So how has the self-publishing trend affected your industry? Because we've seen some plays brought in
Um, <laughs> but, uh, like Robert Paisley, who was here last year, had sent me a collection of great short plays uh, that I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's hard for us. We have a lot. We just published a lot of books of short plays recently. I think they'll compete. Um, but he actually published his own collection and has been licensing them himself over me and his agent. And it's like quite well with it. Um, but he just wanted the book in hand to, to give to people. I'm trying to think if someone else did that too recently where they, oh, like Indie Theater Now. Um, there's that yeah, model. Her time and it plays in sheep, it's a lot. Yeah, Martin Denton, who used to run oh, NewYorkTheater.com, yeah. started an uh, online platform called Indie Theater Now, which is a totally a digital publishing platform. And he ends up taking a lot of yeah. ten minute. I know you cover uh, published Matt Freeman's uh, ten minute plays via that, which I also unfortunately could not publish. Um, so yeah, so there are other options, and I'd say that Indie Theater Now is a little different than self publishing because I think Martin's actually asking. And it's curated. It's curated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so out of uh, you know a lot of these ten minute submissions for have have like fourteen hundred you know submissions. So like, what advice would you give in terms of how to make your play jump out of the stack? That's right. Uh, like, <laughs> 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 what advice yeah. is uh. You know, we see, there's like things that are in the cultural like DNA, and we see, yes. we'll see like 10 plays that are all set in a bar. Like, we divide up the submissions of the packets of 20, and in a packet of 20, four pl plays can be set in a bar, four plays can be on a park bench, four plays will be at a bus stop, and like three are breakup plays. And then you have like two plays out of that packet that, that are take place in a supermarket, or take place in like, it's the end of the world, and somebody, you know, those are like a little more, so, so, I mean, really, if you're writing in a traditional setting and you have a short play, really the idea has to be super original in that setting because you have to know that there's, there's so many other plays that also happen. And in the end, I was just actually talking about that with you, is that like, for our competition, it does come down a bit to programming. Um, and I think a lot of these festivals, you have to have variety. You have to have things that are a little off the wall. You can't have, you know, we have 30 plays. We can't have five of them set in a bar, I mean, it'd be easy for Casey because then the set would be the same, but, you know, for the audience, it would be a little tiring. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, outside the box. And once this year, I talked to some people about the programming this year because it is such a weird festival, like the ones that really rose to the reading process. We have a play where they, like, these two girls kill a baby on stage, I'm like, oh, we'll see. it works in the context of the play, we'll see if it works on stage. We have. Um, you know, a play that's a Japanese robot play that's, you know, Winkler's, that's really crazy. So plays that have really taken some big, big risks, um, and they seem to, to land a lot better. So I'd say, you know, use it to try out your most adventurous idea. And it's I love what John Jory was talking about, like, to push out of the realism box, you know, and I wonder, because in, in you know, the full-length play, that's not necessarily, you know, <laughs>
I mean, I kind of think that, that the most successful 10 minute plays are almost never, but the most produced at any rate, not that successful depends on how you define that. Yeah. But I mean, like, the most produced one short plays that we have are, are you know, David Ives, Chris Durang, people who are not necessarily known for realism. Um, you know, so it seems to me that the, the 10 minute form, the short play form, is is almost built or more geared towards uh, that because of the heightened nature, because they're so compressed. Yeah. I mean, again, when I talk about workshops of writing short plays, I kind of, again, focusing on the word play. So think of it as a full-length play compressed down to 10 minutes. And so everything needs to be heightened and under pressure in a, in a, in right. a different weird way. Or at least when I write my own, they're certainly, like, yeah. they're certainly more absurd than, than yeah, I just want to say to just real quick. I think I, it, it's not just the content is yeah. is also non realistic It's also form. Like you can also mm -hmm. play with form and style. So you can't have a place that in the bar. But like, like I thought what Steve Yockey did with the chorus last night and that convention of the chorus was such an interesting way to tell to add something to the story that was really fundamentally, you know, about differences in couples. But it was this weird like. I think we have to wrap up, but did well, just you want one to thing say I, that? Yeah. Well, one thing that might be useful uh, both to the writers and to you folks in terms of a need from the field. Um, I, I teach on the university level and I've taught on both graduate and undergraduate level. We use a lot of 10 minute plays in the classroom uh, as a semester project or as a teacher. And what we can't find are there are very few plays available to us that are two women, which yes. we need. I mean, we need a few. Uh, and secondly, we need plays which are indeterminate, two character plays which are indeterminate in terms of sex, so that it can be cast with two men, one woman, one man, two women to use in the classroom because you never know what the class composition is, do you know what I mean? And those two areas are really wide open. I always include in my book exactly what, at least two or three examples of exactly what it is. What I put in there, it could be, if you well, if you can contact the field, because I'm out there and I don't know how to talk about it. You've jumped around, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's one title, Exhibit This, by um, Luigi Giannuzzi, which is like, I, I love to tell my high school and college, because it's, it's set, it's like short scenes set in a museum, but it's 26 men or 26 women or six, like it's like 25 different scenes that it's so interchangeable, and the set is just like a room, you know, it's like in like a, so like that it's kind funny. of thing, I would really recommend reading something like that, he does a great <laughs> job of. He also has a, All the King's Women, which is about women obsessed with Elvis, it's like 26 <laughs> <laughs> so, like, and, and the other market, by the way, just told you, uh, that uh, I've been amazed by, uh, because I'm a Jane Austen adapter, is I would say fully, 30% of the productions I get are from Christian schools who are looking for material yeah. within their life view, which does not necessarily inhibit you if that is not your life view. I mean, Jane Austen is fine, right? You can have but there's a big Christian market out there. He actually published Tim by Tim, which had, had a different name. Um, and this was based upon, it was another commission given to 10 of our playwrights to write a play, a 10 minute play based upon one of the 10 commandments. But in that market, in that market, you're actually safer not doing biblical material because of differences in theological view. You're actually better simply writing plays that do not Hit the hot deep. spots yeah. well, that they're are, not doing. These are these yeah. secular yeah. or religious yeah. novels. Yeah. That's why we renamed it um, a ten short plays for teens about ethics and values. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like modern morality. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a, it's going back to that type of thing. Um, so do we have to wrap up? We do because Michael Dixon's here. Oh, <laughs> well, it's going to be a continuation of the Yes. With the publishers. Down in the publishing. Oh.